Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Today the title of the message is God Intervened. God Intervened. And these are two of my favorite passages to preach on for a baptism. I think the last time I used these two passages was in 2010, so that was about four years ago. But let us open up to Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26. And what we do is we pick up in chapter 8 of Acts at verse 26. We pick up that after the preaching of the word, the apostles start heading back to Jerusalem. And in verse 26, Philip, one of the apostles, comes across a Ethiopian eunuch that is riding in a chariot. So let's pick up there in a carriage. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So Philip got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go up and join his chariot. Philip ran up, and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I, unless someone guides me? And the eunuch invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. There are a couple of things we can learn from Acts chapter 8. The first point that we need to see here is that without Jesus Christ, there is no proper understanding of Scripture. I mean, this eunuch is reading from the Old Testament. And those verses in Isaiah that deal with Jesus, we would have no clear understanding of those verses without the fulfillment of Scripture from Jesus Christ coming forth. So that's the first thing we need to understand. Jesus Christ gives meaning to the entire Bible. Notice in verse 35 it says, Philip preaches Jesus. That's what Philip preached. Philip is not preaching to this eunuch, you can have a better life now. And he's not preaching to this eunuch, God has a purpose for your life. And he's not preaching health and wealth and happiness to this eunuch. What he does is he preaches Jesus Christ. He talks about Jesus. What does it mean to preach Jesus Christ? Here's what it means. It means that we preach that which Paul considered to be of the most importance, of the first importance. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 
15, Paul says, And this is of the first importance, the most importance, that Jesus died for our sins. That's what it means to preach Jesus Christ. Preach that he died for your sins, for our sins. And that he was buried and he was raised from the dead. So, how can you believe that he died for your sins? Because he was buried and then was raised from the dead. You have the witness, the proof of that event. And then, how do you know that he was really raised from the dead? Well, there are more than 500 witnesses that saw him. And we have many of their testimonies. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, and many of these are still alive today. You know what? They could have come out of the woodworks and said, nah, he wasn't really raised from the dead. Let's get rid of this letter. But they didn't. Because it's true. More than 500 saw the risen Christ. So we have this evidence. That's what it means to preach Jesus. And then Jesus ascended to the right hand of God where he intercedes for us today. He's been interceding for Paula. And now she's going to be baptized. Why? Because he loves her. Why did he do that for anyone in here? Because he loves us. To preach Jesus means to make men and women see and admit that their sin against God is so bad that they could never do anything to please God. That's part of preaching Jesus. And then what you do is you present to that person, once they see the wickedness of their sin before a just and a holy God, then what you do is you present the kindness of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believe upon him shall not perish but have eternal life. It is by the kindness of God, Paul tells us in Romans, where we will repent once we understand the kindness of God, that he sent his own son to be butchered as a slain lamb in our place. Why? So that God can justly forgive our sins. What does it mean by that? Well, God says, okay, I made my son Jesus Christ sin. I punished your sins on him. So now I can justly forgive your sins because your sins have been punished. And if you believe that, that your sins have in fact been punished in the, the flesh of Jesus Christ, and if you will believe that and turn in repentance towards God, then I will forgive your sins and I can justly do it is what God says. There's something we really interesting about this eunuch here. In verse 26, we are told that the eunuch went up to Jerusalem, he worshipped God, and now he's on his way back. What does that mean? What does that mean in layman's terms? Today's, I think we're the 21st century. What does it mean in 21st century terms? It means he went to church. The eunuch went to church. And the most holy of churches in Jerusalem. All right? And he's on his way back. And verse 28 tells us that the eunuch reads his Bible. So, here, so what do we have? We've got this guy from Ethiopia who is a churchgoer that reads his Bible. But we also learn the second thing from Acts chapter 8. Going to church and reading your Bible is not enough. It's not enough. Why? How do we know that? Because God sent Philip to this eunuch. Because he had gone to church, he had worshipped God, he was reading his Bible, the Old Testament passages, and he hadn't had a clue what was going on. He didn't even understand God. He didn't understand Jesus Christ. What is needed for salvation is a life-changing belief that Jesus Christ alone can bring salvation. It's more than just going to church. It's more than just reading your Bible. It's, it's actually admitting that the only one who can save you is named Jesus. Now, let's turn to Acts chapter 10 since we're still in Acts and go to verse 1. Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. And don't close your Bible. We're going to be going through Acts chapter 10 a bit here. Acts chapter 10, 1. Now, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion, and what was of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household, and gave many alms to the Jewish people, and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God, who had just come to him and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? 
And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send them for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. So now let's jump ahead to verse 30 in chapter 10. Because what we have in verse 30 is we've got Peter has just come. He's standing before Cornelius. And now Cornelius is explaining to Peter why Cornelius sent for him. And it says this starting in verse 30. Cornelius said, Four days ago to this hour I was praying in my house during the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and visit Simon, who is also called Peter, and have him come to you. Now, what do we need to see about this? It's very similar to Acts chapter 8. Here's what we need to see. We need to see that this man, Cornelius, was a devout man who feared God, who gave away his money, and who prayed that this religious man before us needed to hear something more in order to be saved that he would not perish and die in his sins. I mean, look at this. We have a man that is devout, fears God, gives his money away and prays, but God says that's not enough. It's not enough to just do those religious things. You've got to have something else. You've got to hear about Jesus. Go get Peter. Have Peter come. So in verse 34, we hear Peter. Now he's standing before Cornelius, who has sent for him. And it says this in verse 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. He's talking to a a non-Jewish person, a Gentile. He's saying, I am most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and done what, does what is right is welcome to him. So what do we have here? In Romans, it says, Romans chapter 1, it says, that even though they knew God, they did not acknowledge God. They did not, you know, make him part of their lives. But what we have here is we have two men, a eunuch, and we have a... Uh, Roman centurion and they both are acknowledging God they see the creation they're acknowledging him so what does God do God does exactly what Peter says he sees that they are men that fear him and that does do what is right so now he's going to welcome those two he's going to give those two an opportunity to come on to himself by sending missionaries out to share the word of Christ with them to share the gospel. So that's what we have here. We have devoutness. So some people that really are seeking after God and they really love God and they're going after God but yet they do not know who God is but they are acknowledging Him. God will oftentimes send somebody to them with the gospel that would give them the opportunity to hear and to believe. So starting at verse 36, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Lord of all. You want peace, there's no other way that you're going to find peace but through Jesus Christ. That is the only way you're going to have peace in your life. And that is what he's saying is God, in verse 36, Peter is saying that God sent to the sons of Israel who were enemies of God a way that they might come to know God in peace, and that is through Jesus Christ. You yourselves know, he continues in verse 37, you yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him, and with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did both in this land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. Not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify 
that this is the one, Jesus is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and of the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. What did these devout people need to hear about? What did this man that prayed and that gave away his money and that worshiped God? I mean, what do these people need to hear? They need to hear about Jesus forgiving sins. Because no matter, of, no matter the amount of religion you practice, you're not going to get to heaven. You need Jesus to forgive your sins. Plain, simple, period. Peter preaches Jesus. Paul preaches Jesus. Philip preaches Jesus. They all preach Jesus because Jesus is the answer to the forgiveness of men's sins and women's sins. Peter preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ because religious men and women do not go to heaven. Religious men and women do not go to heaven. Forgiven men and women, they are the ones who go to heaven. And Peter knew that. He knew that the almsgiving, the God-fearing, the praying of this religious man would not take him to heaven, but the forgiveness of his sins would. And God loved Cornelius enough to send somebody to him to tell him religion was not enough, but he needed the word of God through Jesus Christ to forgive his sins. Jesus Christ alone is the means of salvation. Now, chapter 10 ends with uh, the baptism of those who have heard and believed what Jesus has, uh, what Peter has proclaimed about Jesus. Because baptism is the sign that you believe what has been said about Jesus and preached about Jesus. The eunuch and the centurion, these two religious people, they needed to hear about and to believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins so that they would not die and perish in eternity in hell. I mean, we need to remember this, please. Good people do not go to heaven. Only forgiven people do. No person deserves for God to intervene into their lives and to forgive them their sins. But because God is rich in mercy and because he is abounding in love, God often does intervene into the lives of men and women and present them with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they have an opportunity to believe upon that gospel that Jesus died for their sins, to place their faith into him, in him and to be saved and to live a new life in Christ. He gives them that opportunity. If a man and a woman or a woman truly acknowledges and reveres the God of creation and truly learn, yearns to have relationship with that God, God will do what he did in these cases here. He will send missionaries to them. He will send people with the word of Christ that they might actually believe and know his forgiveness. God intervened in the men of these, the lives of these two men in the Bible today. God could have left them both to, to themselves to die in their sins, but he didn't. You know what? God could have left me to my own ways that I would die in my sins. And he didn't do that. I mean, God could have left Paula to herself to die in her sins, but he didn't do that. God intervened. God could have left you to yourself to just go in about all your own little ways and your own little world. And then you would have died in your sins, but he didn't do that. God, in his love, intervened. God so loved us that he gave his only son that if we would believe upon Jesus, if we would give him the credit for salvation, and if we would give him the glory that he deserves, then he would save us. That we would not perish. I mean, while, while the eunuch was dead in his sin of meaningless religion, God intervened. While the centurion was dead in his sin of good works, God intervened. While Paul was dead in his sin on the road to Damascus and dead in his pride, God intervened. When Paula was dead in her sin, living a life apart from God, God intervened. While I was dead in my sin and you were dead in your sins, no matter how religious we were at the time, no matter how many good deeds and no matter how many bad deeds we were doing, the grace of God has intervened in our lives. And he has given us an opportunity to place our faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. God intervenes. 
And God gives us the faith to believe that Jesus took the punishment of our sins so that upon believing that, there is a desire now in our hearts to follow Him and we will turn from ungodly ways and turn to the risen Lord. God intervenes and does that for us. By grace we have been saved through faith and that not of ourselves. That faith was not of ourselves. It was given to us. It was a free gift of God. Not as a result of works and none of us can just sit around in heaven and say, yeah, I did this, I got here. No, it's because of Him, Jesus Christ. God knows religion is not enough, so He sent Jesus. God knows good works cannot make up for all of our bad ones, so He sent Jesus. God knows that just being better than our neighbor isn't good enough, so He sent Jesus. God sent His Son to die on the cross because there was no other way for Him to save us in a just manner except through the shed blood of His own Son. Justice had to be satisfied and God satisfied justice by intervening on our behalf by sacrificing his own son that Jesus might become a ransom for us. The price paid to buy us back from the master's sin. You know what? God knows what every one of us must learn. He knows that a man and a woman can be very religious but yet remain unsaved. God knows that we can worship Him, we can sing songs to Him, that we can say, yeah, the man upstairs is my God, and yet remain unsaved. God knows that people can pick up and read their Bible like this Ethiopian eunuch and still remain unsaved. God knows that people can pray and yet remain unsaved. They don't even know who they're praying to and He ain't listening anyways. He only listens to the saved. God knows that people can give away all their money and still remain unsaved. They can do all sorts of things and make all kinds of personal sacrifices. Hindus, Buddhists, they do all this stuff all the time. Muslims, man, five times a day they're praying. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, all these people are working, 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 working to get their way to heaven. They're all religious, but they do not have Jesus Christ. God knows that to be saved, Jesus Christ must come. Unless a man or a woman hears and believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins, then they will not be saved from their sins. But if they will hear that, and like this eunuch, and like this centurion today, and like Paula, and like many of us in this room, if they will hear that Jesus died for their sins, and they will realize that no amount of good work that they can do will ever save them from their own sins, then they can be saved when they turn to Jesus. And I praise God for His intervention. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you have intervened into our lives and that you have saved us. By your grace we have been saved through faith and that not of ourselves, for it is truly a free work of God, a gift of God that has given us, and we are so thankful. Lord, this day we are thankful for the reminder that religion is not enough, that Bible reading is not enough, that you know, just saying we believe in Jesus is not enough, that there has to be a true belief that changes a man's or a woman's heart. And we are thankful that that has taken place in so many here today. Father, we are thankful for this opportunity in a moment to baptize our sister Paula as she makes the profession of faith, the good profession that so many have made before her. And we just ask that you will bless her in her readiness. And we ask all this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.